thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is Adam Levick, co-editor of Camera UK, which is based in Camera's Israel office in Jerusalem. Um, now, I was fortunate enough to begin working with Tamar Sternthal in the Israel office when it first opened. And though I, along with my Camera UK co-editor, Hadar Silla, monitor the UK media, working with Tamar, as well as the Hebrew, Arabic, and campus teams, has given me extremely important tools in my fight against British media bias. When I come across inaccurate reporting about Israel in The Guardian or BBC, working in the Israel office allows me to, in real time, consult with colleagues in our office to see how that story has been reported in the media outlets that they cover. So this means, for instance, that when I come across a really problematic article in The Guardian that was based on a piece first published, let's say, in Haaretz in Hebrew, I can consult with Tamar and other colleagues in the office who cover the Hebrew media to see if the Guardian misrepresented the story or if there are any other important elements of the original story that I should know about, facts which these colleagues who monitor the Hebrew press daily are uniquely privy to. Also, as many British media articles are based, at least in part, on wire service stories from AP, Reuters, AFP, etc., I often consult with Tamar, who monitors these media outlets daily. Moreover, when Tamar gets one of the wire services to correct a false claim about Israel, I can often leverage that to get a British media outlet who published the exact same wire service article um, to correct their story. So in short, you know, the media isn't a monolith, but a series of interconnected outlets, which though operating in different languages and in different offices around the world, nonetheless impact each other in a myriad of ways. And this is why Camera's global approach is uniquely suited to fighting media bias against Israel within the various national media landscapes. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing my colleague, Tamar Sternthal, Director of Camera's Israel Office, to share her thoughts on the impact of the organization's international efforts. We'll hear from Tamar for about 25 minutes, after which we'll go to the Q&A session. Um, I'll begin perhaps with some questions of my own, and then you'll have the opportunity to submit your written questions by running your cursor along the bottom of your screen until you see the icon that says Q&A. Click there to type in questions during the talk. Now over to you, Tamar. Welcome to everyone for joining us. As I sit here at home in central Israel, speaking with you by Zoom wherever you are, and last I checked yesterday, you hail from at least half a dozen countries, so that's very exciting. One basic lesson from the pandemic has become crystal clear. We are living in a highly connected, globalized world. That's no less true when it comes to media. And unfortunately, media bias against Israel is certainly not exempt. I will start with one example that's not particularly exceptional. This past May, an English language Pakistani digital media outlet published a fake news report claiming that then Israeli health minister Yaakov Litzman said that the coronavirus was divine punishment for homosexuality. Though the former minister has been known to voice homophobic sentiments, he has never said that. A different Israeli rabbi, Rabbi Meir Mazuz, not a senior government official, had made the odious statement. Nevertheless, the falsehood, Pakistani in origin, overcame the distance of continents, cultures, ideologies, and languages, appearing, for example, in the British LGBT site Pink News, in Daily Kos, a left-wing activist site, the progressive human web, web the progressive secular humanist website, in the Hindu business line in India, and in Al Hora, the US-based Arab public television channel. Camera prompted correction of this falsehood around the world in English and Arabic. In addition, the falsehood appeared in a French LGBT magazine and our partner organization in Paris compelled the publication to retract the story. From my perch in Jerusalem's office, I have the exciting task of spearheading cameras monitoring of the international wire services, checking for accuracy and prompting improvement before they are published in newspapers of various languages around the world. I have a front row seat at Perspectiva, Camera's Hebrew site, and manage Camera Arabic, our newest edition on the international front. 
and I coordinate with our US based Spanish department, Revista de Medio Orient, along with our partner in Paris, Afoiki Tabla, an independent media watch site working in French. What I find most exciting is the dynamic interplay between the different departments when the impact of their respective activities reverberates far beyond their specific languages and countries. A single recent correspondence with the bureau chief of a leading wire service included an exchange of emails containing English, Hebrew, French, and Spanish. Working together with Afoikitabla in France, the organizations achieved Agence France press corrections in English, French, and Spanish of the erroneous claim that Malawi's opening of a Jerusalem embassy would be the first for an African nation in Israel's capital city. In fact, while Malawi's Jerusalem embassy will be the only one currently in operation, several were located there until the Yom Kippur War in 1973. My tenure at camera, spanning more than two decades, coincides with the media's globalization, which necessitated camera's own international growth. In 1999, as a research analyst in the Boston headquarters of the Committee for Accuracy and Middle East Reporting in America, I, along with the organization at large, was primarily focused on, you guessed it, American media outlets. Since that time, the media landscape shifted dramatically in the face of globalization. CNN launched an Arabic website. In subsequent years, Huffington Post, in partnership with the Madrid-based Al País, launched in Spanish and later on on its own in Arabic. Al Jazeera launched in English. Sky News Arabia, half owned by Comcast and half owned by an Emirati company belonging to a royal family, launched in 2012. The New York Times and Washington Post have added select Arabic and Spanish content, and so on. Now in Israel, I oversee the ebb and flow of media reports crossing over between languages and countries. How did a local Hebrew report get mistranslated into English and become the basis for a false report in the international press? Does an error in the English language wire surface also appear in the French version of the same article by the same agency. Are we able to use corrections that we prompted in English to leverage improvement in Arabic of the ubiquitous program in its Israel problems in its Israel coverage? Camera's integrated multilingual approach is one of the organization's unique assets which bring ever growing results. Fittingly, last year, we were compelled to shed our geographically constrained name, Committee for Accuracy and Middle East Reporting in America, in favor of Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting and Analysis. In around 2008, CAMERA launched its first non-English language department, Revista de Medio Orient, given the huge population of Spanish speakers in North America. But Revista's work also covers Spanish language media in Central and South America, as well as Spain, focusing on influential media outlets like El País and EFE, the leading Spanish news agency. About a decade ago, CAMERA stepped up its activity in the British realm, taking under our wing the independent SIF Watch, along with the sister, well, the sister site BBC Watch, the two eventually evolved into their current shared iteration, Camera UK. In 2010, in, recognize, in recognition of the fact that much of the misinformation in the international media originates right here in the local Israeli press, we founded Perspectiva, our Hebrew department. Among foreign journalists, policymakers, diplomats, students, and researchers, the Israeli Daily Haaretz is the most influential Israeli media outlet, enjoying a grossly disproportionate international readership in comparison to its tiny Hebrew reading audience here in Israel. The English language edition is published daily alongside the New York Times and the popular English website reaches a wide readership, advancing falsehoods about the Jewish state. With an authentically Israeli source, anti-Israel falsehoods gain greater, albeit undeserved, credibility. 
Those who tuned into the webinar last month with Prospectiva Editor-in-Chief Hanan Amior learned about Haaretz's Jewish-only roads myth, a falsehood which in the past routinely appeared in major international media outlets, including Associated Press, CNN, Boston Globe, and elsewhere. The truth is that while limited parts of some West Bank roads are prohibited to Palestinian traffic, they're open to all Israelis without any regard to race or religion, Jews, Muslims, Christians alike, a reality that takes the wind out of the Jewish-only roads apartheid smear. Cameron Perspectiva brought an end to that falsehood in Aretz, prompting a series of corrections of the lie abroad and precipitated the virtual eradication of the once prevalent myth from the international media landscape. It's not only English speaking reporters who look to Haaretz to set their agenda. A Spanish speaking journalist once told me that even among his colleagues, the newspaper is hugely influential. Publisher Amos Shakin once boasted, quote, if news is coming out of Israel, it is coming from Haaretz more often than not. Our close monitoring of the paper's coverage in English and Hebrew over years documented and ultimately slowed an astounding phenomenon. Haaretz's English edition doesn't just translate articles from its Hebrew counterpart, it also whitewashes them, slanting them in one direction. When it comes to Palestinian or Arab militancy, violence or rejectionism, Haaretz's English edition has frequently downplayed or entirely omitted information about these misdeeds. In some instances, the English account is completely at odds with the Hebrew original. The second complementary element of what we at Camera have dubbed Haaretz Lost in Translation involves the introduction of misinformation reflecting negatively on Israel, which did not appear in the Hebrew original. We have documented literally scores of these mistranslations on our site, but in the interest of time, I will share just one case, starring Peter Beinart, who recently was granted a new platform as a New York Times contributing opinion writer. In May 2014, Haaretz's English language headline claimed, quote, Lagba Omer in Hebron, Settlers Torch, Palestinian Orchard. Lagba Omer is a Jewish holiday celebrated in Israel with bonfires. There's just one problem with this headline. It's completely false. The accompanying article did not at all support the claim that settlers torched a Palestinian orchard. It stated, settlers in Hebron celebrated Lagba Omer by lighting a bonfire in an olive grove. It went on to state, quote, the fire approached the Palestinians' olive trees while the young Israelis burned the flags of the Palestinian Authority, Fatah, and the team of international observers. So what actually happened? Settlers burned flags, not an orchard. The Hebrew headline, unlike the English, never alleged that settlers torched an orchard. It stuck to the facts, however less dramatic and incriminating, quote, settlers from Hebron lit a bonfire in an olive grove. Within a day, camera compelled Haaretz to correct. The correction stated, the headline of this article was amended to reflect the fact that none of the trees in the orchard were burned. In the meantime, though, Beinart, who apparently hadn't bothered to actually read the article, tweeted the false headline to his 24,000 followers and added his own embellishment, Lagba Omer Pogrom. And like that, nothing more than a harmless bonfire turned into a pogrom. Beinart too had to apologize. So as we see, the international press picks up Haaretz's English misinformation giving it even greater traction and attention. In 2017, in the wake of the so-called Arab Spring and great unrest in the region, which prompted a mass flow of Arabic speakers to Europe and beyond, Camera set out to establish an Arabic department to monitor the Arabic language reports of Western media outlets like CNN, Reuters, Agence France Presse, Sky News, France 24, Deutsche Welle, and more. We decided to focus specifically on Western media outlets because they are subject to journalistic codes of ethics, which require accuracy, accountability, and professionalism. 
there was a huge need for this project. Often, English language editors were completely unaware of misinformation published on their own platform in Arabic. Partisan language and unfounded claims that English language editors consider unacceptable appeared unchecked in Arabic under their own brand names. This was a gaping hole that no one had previously addressed. We learned, for instance, about the ubiquitous false references to Tel Aviv as Israel's capital, a seemingly immutable phenomenon to which some observers were resigned. Indeed, some Arabic speaking journalists were so wedded to this anti-Israel falsehood that they were not deterred even in the face of patently absurd formulations, such as Agence France Presse's winner, quote, Tel Aviv considers all of Jerusalem its capital, or its tortured twin at CNN Arabic, quote, Tel Aviv was granted American recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. While the erroneous usage of Tel Aviv as shorthand for Israel sometimes creeps up in English language media reports, ed editors invariably correct when the problem is pointed out. But a correction of the Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv falsehood in Arabic language reports? Just four years ago, that looked as unthinkable as normalization with United Arab Emirates. Indeed, when Camera Arabic started, there was no precedent for the system, systematic monitoring of coverage and routine correction requests regarding errors in coverage of Israel in Arabic. And yet, in recent weeks, leveraging correction of the Tel Aviv falsehood in English language news reports, Camera Arabic is chipping away at the falsehood in Arabic prompting Arabic corrections of misidentifications of Tel Aviv as Israel's capital at CNN, BBC, al Hora, and Deutsche Welle. That is a remarkable achievement. And another indication that Camera Arabic is successfully breaking down entrenched dogma traditionally embraced by the Arabic language media, but not tolerated by English language counterparts, Camera Arabic compelled independent Arabia a new Arabic platform founded in 2019 to drop its practice of the mislabeling of Southern Israeli communities next to the Gaza Strip as quote unquote settlements. These communities, Moshavim, Kibbutzim, and cities like Sterot or Ashkelon are fully within Israel's pre-1967 lines and do not qualify as settlements, which lie beyond the armistice or green line and which do not enjoy legitimacy in the eyes of much of the world. Similarly, Camera Arabic secured agreement from a Sky News Arabia reporter to cease labeling Israeli communities within Israel's pre-1967 lines as settlements. These are hard-earned, profound shifts which resulted from systematic monitoring and documentation, exposure of the falsehoods both in English and in Arabic, and private communication with Arabic-speaking journalists. In short, a reproduction of Camera's successful decades-old MO in the unchartered realm of Arabic media. Our long-standing productive relationships with editors accustomed to following up on Camera's correction requests regarding English language reports have also been an asset. When we began communicating with Reuters about errors in Arabic items, we were pleasantly surprised that our regular con contacts there seamlessly stepped up taking responsibility for the Arabic items. What we feared could be a difficult, hard-won precedent, as it was in other media outlets, pleasantly turned out to be quite routine. As with erroneous Hebrew news items, misinformation that starts in the Arabic media does not necessarily stay there. Thus, when Sky News Arabia recently inflated the encouraging findings from a Zogby poll on Arab public support for normalization, those overstated numbers found their way into a Hebrew report in Israel Hayom. From there, it was a short jump to Israel Hayom's English edition, then on to the partners over at Jewish News Service, followed by the Algeminer. Camera was in touch with the various editors, communicating respectively in Arabic, Hebrew, and English. All the aforementioned media outlets corrected, with Sky News Arabia in particular doing a thorough job amending both the headline and various points throughout the text. The conservative Washington Examiner was the only holdout 
failing to make any effort to correct. As for Sky News Arabia, those corrections on Arab support for normalization marked a turning point. Until then, Sky News Arabia stood as the most obstinate Arabic language media outlet, time and again refusing to correct. As I noted before, Sky News Arabia is part Emirati owned. So maybe this step toward accountability in coverage of Israel is another welcome fruit of normalization. Before normalization with the Gulf states, there was camera cooperation with the French. That is, the French media monitoring organization in Paris, Amphoui Tabla, headed by Laurent Chaim. Particularly with respect to the Agence France Press Wire Service, which publishes in French, English, Arabic, and Spanish, camera has a great deal of common ground and cooperation with Amphoui Tabla. Much like camera's Israel office, compares the Hebrew versus English text of Haaretz, Camera and Amphiliki Tabla compare the English and French versions of AFP articles. And then a look at the Arabic and Spanish versions inevitably follow as well. If an error exists in one language, but not the other, we can leverage the correct copy to fix the inaccurate language. For example, in 2019, an English language AFP article about the trial for the suspected terrorist charged with shooting four people dead in the Brussels Jewish Museum in 2014 opened by describing him, quote, as a very polite Frenchman. The absurd description was in quotation marks to be sure, words borrowed from his defense attorneys. But what justifiable place was there for them in the opening sentence about an alleged brutal murderer? Indeed, those who read down to the 20th paragraph got a different view, that of the French journalist held captive in Syria by the very same name, by, by the very same quote, very polite Frenchman. The released traumatized journalist disputed the characterization. Very polite, very urbane, sure, he said, I will never forget the capacity for violence. The parallel French article appropriately did not open with the whitewash of the brutal suspected murderer as a kind gentleman, a fact which likely assisted in camera's success in getting the editors to immediately remove the inexcusable description from the English version. Of course, bad coverage is not always unique to just one language. Sometimes a wire service item gets it wrong in multiple languages. In these cases as well, camera and fico Amphoukitabla cooperation is fruitful. For example, in November 2018, terrorists in the Gaza Strip launched some 460 rockets and mortar shells at scores of southern Israeli communities within days. Yet an AFP graphic distributed in English, French, Arabic, and Spanish, reportedly meant to illustrate locations that had been hit, marked exactly two communities. Camera alerted Amphoui Tabla to the egregiously inaccurate map. And as a result of the French organization's follow-up, AFP completely overhaul overhauled the graphic in all four languages and appended a correction. Until now, I focused on the cross-lingual aspect of news agencies like Reuters and Agence France Presse. But even if we're talking only about English language coverage, the international reach of the wire services cannot be understated. In recent years, as news outlets faced severe cutbacks and were forced to close form bureaus, the wire services like the Associated Press, Reuters, United Press International, and Deutsche Press Agentur have become increasingly influential as news outlets have been forced to become more dependent upon them for content. That means when one of these agencies makes a mistake, the mistake does not appear in just one media outlet. It appears in many media outlets. As a result, that one piece of misinformation becomes even more damaging, potentially reverberating far and wide. By the same token, when camera compels one of these news agencies to correct, the correction takes on an amplified importance, reaching at times scores of media outlets. With our office in Jerusalem, working on the same time zone as bureaus here in the region, 
camera staff in Israel is able to monitor the wire service stories as they appear and prompt correction within the same news cycle. In other words, we are able to preemptively prevent the misinformation from appearing online and in print in media outlets around the world. Here's just one example. In March, as the pandemic was taking hold in the Middle East, the Associated Press falsely reported that Israel's blockade of the Gaza Strip, quote, prevents the passage of even critical goods like surgical supplies. In fact, x-ray machines, defined as dual-use items, which are items that can be used either for civilian or for military purposes, were, are heavily restricted, but they are not prohibited by Israel. And the x-ray machines are the exception in a policy which otherwise permits the entrance freely of surgical supplies. Camera's quick follow-up ensured that AP's updated article did not contain the false claim that Israel prevents surgical supplies from reaching the Gaza Strip. Editors also commendably added information about Hamas's mismanagement of medical infrastructure in the territory. As a result, secondary media outlets from ABC News to Canadian Press to the Northern Advocate of New Zealand published the correct information and did not perpetuate the false charge that Israel is preventing medical supplies from reaching the Gaza Strip. While the benefit of preemptively preventing the spread of misinformation is easily understood, the value of prompting corrections is often not appreciated. Corrections, even if they are buried on page three, while the original error was prominent on the front page, serve several important functions. First, they put journalists on notice, alerting them that they will be held accountable for misreporting whether the cause was sloppiness or maliciousness. While it's the job of journalists to put their subjects under a microscope, they'd rather not have that microscope focused on them. Second, corrections mean the falsehood will be expunged from the online articles that live on digitally indefinitely. Similarly, news databases append the correction to the original article, ensuring that journalists, policymakers, students, researchers, and others of goodwill will not rehash the misinformation. Corrections on key issues can prompt policy changes at media outlets, and such institutional changes are long lasting and impactful. Moreover, as we've seen today, corrections at significant media outlets can be used to leverage corrections and better coverage at other media outlets, even in different countries and different languages. In this way, we can prompt system systemic change, improve coverage on a global level. And this is just what we've done at CAMERA. 2018 was a record year at CAMERA when we prompted 206 substantive media corrections. But guess what? This year, we have surpassed that impressive record with 280 corrections and counting. There are still a few days left to go. There are many variables which could affect the achievement of more or fewer corrections. But I firmly believe that it is our international activity work, working across languages and borders, which has allowed for our growing unprecedented success, prompting better, more accurate coverage of Israel. The young camera Arabic in particular has flourished this year, prompting an amazing 32 corrections an impressive feat considering that just three years ago, the department was starting from zero. A lie can travel halfway around the world while the truth is putting on its cho shoes, goes the famous adage. But here's the postscript. Not only is Camera International close on the lie's heels, but it is also preemptively cutting them off. And that makes all the difference in the world. Thank you very much to all of our supporters for making this vital work possible. Back to you, Adam. Thanks, Tamar, very much for that thorough and really interesting uh, talk about uh, what you do in the international office. Um, let's go right to questions. There's a lot of very interesting questions and uh, don't want to miss any. Um, so first question is, does camera keep statistics on the numbers of erroneous and false articles by publication and or author, 
Um, such statistics can be used to broadly uh, expose bias by such sources with the objective of casting doubt on their veracity and demonstrating their political agendas. We don't keep, um, that's a good question. We don't keep statistics per se, but our website is very helpfully divided by media outlet or journalist. So anybody um, who goes to the toggles at the top can search um, for all of our posts according to media outlet or look up a particular journalist. And we also keep um, close track of all of our corrections. So you can look up uh, corrections by media outlet, by journalists, Actually, I don't think we have the ability by journalists, but by media outlet or topic, where you can just go through chronologically and see and see what we've done. Okay, thanks. We have another question. Uh, often retractions in newspapers are the size of a postage stamp uh, after the initial inaccurate article spreads several news columns, meaning that the importance is considerably diminished. Does camera ever become involved or support libel litigation against the offending publication since a potential threat to the pocketbook seems to get their attention uh, under, their under their circumstances? Well, libel cases in the United States are very difficult because not only do you have to prove uh, the falsehood, but you have to improve intent. And, and that's very difficult to do. And there's, there's very little in the way of pre precedent in terms of uh, successful litigation on that. Um, but we we do we do we have in the past filed um, appeal cases to the Israel Press Council, uh, which is a body of journalists which has the ability to adjudicate about complaints. And I know that you can speak, you can address what the situation is in England because you're you're the most um, expert between us on, on what the situation is there. So it really depends between country, not so much in terms of libel cases, but going to professional bodies of of journalists, uh, whether it's the Israel Press Council or uh, IPSO or, or Ofcom in England, which you can address, um, and uh, these these bodies do have the ability to rule on the misdoings of their colleagues. Uh, but our experience in Israel has been that, unfortunately, um, while the Israel Press Council will, will rule and has ruled in our favor in the past, it has no it, no teeth, no ability to enforce. It's decision, for instance, that a media outlet must correct. Um, and so uh, in the United States, the situation, um, we don't have any comparable body to the Israel Press Council. So for instance, lawyers and doctors, there are, uh, there, there's professional recourse, a lawyer or a doctor who commits malpractice or, or violates their professional codes can be disbarred or lose their license. And there's no comparable process um, in the United States uh, for that. Um, and as I already explained, the, the libel uh, cases are, are quite difficult and, and not fruitful. Um, so that leads us to the course of action that we do take, which is exposure of the falsehood, um, appeal to private appeal to fair play, and public exposure of the falsehood. And uh, oftentimes journalists don't like to have the negative attention. And uh, the process of exposing them does uh, does lead to positive results as, as we've seen today. But, but why don't you go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about the, the process for appeals in the UK with Ofcom. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, in the UK, there's several uh, public bodies that are, uh, whose objective it is to um, regulate the, the press, the media. Um, so there's IPSA, which stands for the Independent Press Standards Organization. There's Ofcom. Um, and there's an organization called Impress. Now, most of the media outlets in the UK are uh, regulated. Now, it, it's up to each media outlet whether or not they want to sign up for these uh, public uh, me media regulatory agencies. But if they do, it means that they are bound by the decisions that these um, media regulatory agencies make. So that if I were to complain to, uh, say, the Times of London or the Telegraph, both of those two uh, media outlets are um, under the eye of IPSO. So that if I don't get a correction and I think um, it was unfair, I can appeal to IPSO. And whatever IPSO decides, the Telegraph and the Times uh, has to abide by. They have to correct. And in fact, um, some of these uh, public uh, regulatory agencies have the power to fine media outlets if they uh, violate their standards. 
However, there are a few, you know, it, it's, you know, I guess ironic that the most problematic uh, media outlets in the UK with The Guardian um, and The Independent uh, aren't, have chosen to not be regulated by these uh, public regulatory bodies. And so um, they regulate themselves, which is um, pretty funny. So yeah, so the difference between media outlets that are regulated and the, and versus those that aren't regulated is huge. So it means the ones that aren't regulated can uh, lie about Israel with impunity. It's a big difference. And you know, I've always wondered what, why there isn't uh, more of a push um, by the Israeli public to get a, a regulatory agency in Israel that has teeth. Um, or maybe that would go against the nature of the um, Israeli culture, but it certainly is a very big uh, tool that we have when we uh, attempt to get uh, media outlets in the UK to correct false reports. Um, so let's go to another question about Haaretz. Um, how much market share in Israel does Haaretz enjoy? Oh, pe periodically we see the figures on this um, from an organization that publishes numbers equivalent to the Nielsen ratings. It, it is under 5%. I mean, it is a tiny uh, circulation in Israel, both the website uh, and the print publication, even less so, as, as is the nature of print publication everywhere in the world for every publication. Um, but uh, yeah, so its influence internationally, as I said, is completely disproportionate to the minuscule population in Israel that, that do read it. Yeah, that actually brings me to another question, and this is something I'm personally interested in about. While we're staying on Haaretz, why, in your view, is Haaretz so influential internationally, especially among foreign correspondents, diplomats, and opinion leaders? Um, is it because Haaretz simply affirms and legitimizes their already skewed opinions? Or, in your view, Tamar, does it actually help shape their views? I think it's both. I think for people who are already coming with a, a bias tilted against Israel, Haaretz affirms their beliefs. They know about Haaretz um, because, for instance, uh, their most notorious writers who call Israel an apartheid state, like Gidon Levy, for years appeared in international forums and panels in Europe, coming to campuses in the United States. So uh, th their information is out there. Many, many stories that are uh, just smearing Israel with falsehoods have been reproduced on the website of David Dyke, uh, David Duke, uh, Haaretz stories. So those who have harbor these views against uh, Israel can look to Haaretz. And um, those who maybe aren't as hardcore, but, uh, it, it, but believe that, okay, maybe they look to the Jerusalem Post or something that's more centrist as, well, that's a parochial Israeli publication, right? We're not going to get a truthful view because that's that's just reflecting, you know, um, Israeli interests or something like that. But maybe they feel that Haaretz, with all of its its negative and often false news, not that Jerusalem Post doesn't give stories that aren't favorable to Israel, um, that it, it it it's more credible. So so it it, it um, they look at it as as more. Um, credible source which which reflects their views and also um, is not just some sort of you know, parochial dismiss a, a, an Israeli source because it is Israeli, right? So it works both ways. If it's affirming something that you believe uh, and it's Israeli, then it has more credibility. But if it's saying something that you don't believe, then you can dismiss it as just an Israeli source. Okay, staying on Haaretz, we have another question. Um, given that Haaretz's readership in Israel is so small, who keeps Haaretz afloat financially? Um, I know that several years ago, Haaretz was part uh, was purchased by a German company, um, with I, I I believe had some uh, uh, Nazi uh, background or roots. Uh, I don't remember the details too closely. A publishing house uh, during World War II, but it is part. It's owned by the Schaffen family for many many years, many generations, and partly um, German owned in the last few years. Okay. Also, why, in your opinion, uh, well, I guess this, this kind of uh, overlaps with my question, but do you think that Haaretz, uh, what do you think accounts for most of the errors in Haaretz? I mean, in other words, do you think that, you know, these Israelis that are working for uh, Haaretz, uh, do you think they are intentionally writing, uh, making claims that they know to be false? Do they not know them to be false? 
Um, do they not care whether they're true? Like, what do you think at the end of the day motivates so many errors from Haaretz? What's the, what's the primary uh, theme that you see? The primary theme, that, that's to, I, I think for the most extreme writers like Gideon Levy, he is just, um, and he has so many factual errors, blatant factual errors. He is just so pathological in his hatred of the Jewish state that I think that that is what drives him and that is what is behind his, you know, his just blatant disregard for the facts to, to report as he does that there are no, there's no, there's one swimming pool. I remember a story several years ago where there was a sort of a decrepit little water park in, uh, near Jericho and he said that this pathetic place, the children didn't know how to swim because it's the only place that they can go swimming. Well, meanwhile, his colleague, then colleague at the Jerusalem Post, uh, sorry, at Haaretz, Avi Esakharov, who since left Haaretz, now he's at the Jerusalem Post, he's a writer for the popular show Fauda. In any event, back at the time in Haaretz, he had published the story several months before the Skidol Levy story where, about all the swimming pools in the Palestinian cities and towns in the West Bank. You know, every major city in the West Bank has a swimming pool, some have several. Um, and then, you know, get on every, nevertheless, even though we did this huge expose exposing what a lie and falsehood and publishing photographs of swimming pools from all over the West Bank, Palestinian owned swimming pools. Then he went on to report that there's uh, just one swimming pool in the Gaza Strip. So, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't deterred at all. That didn't give him any, any pause or, or thought, well, maybe he should be more careful. But I have to say there are um, many journals at Haaretz who are very professional. Um, and doing very solid work. So it is not across the board. And many of these translation problems that we see, um, I suspect come from young, ideological, underpaid um, Anglo-Israelis, perhaps new immigrants who are very ideological and don't necessarily know a lot because they are introducing misinformation into the, um, into the English edition, sometimes inserting false information sort of canards that you hear over and over again, falsehoods uh, about what the, um, for instance, what the Nakba law is claiming that uh, it's, it is forbidden for anyone to celebrate or to commemorate rather the Nakba in Israel. And, that, and that's a falsehood that crept, crept up several times in the English edition of Haaretz. And actually what the Nakba law says is that a state funded institution, such as a school or a cultural you know, institution, um, can can lose its funding if it uh, if it perpetuates the, the the Nakba notion that the founding of Israel was a catastrophe in 1948. And, uh, and, and but 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 probably young translators have frequently misinterpreted right. this, and and editors will um, most often correct when it's brought to their attention. Well, well, that that actually um, brings to mind uh, a journalist for her arts that. Um, overlaps with uh, my British media coverage, and that is Anshel Pfeiffer, who, um, as you know, contributes also to the Times of London and also to The Economist. Do you think he, would you say he's somewhat of an outlier in his relatively, you know, Israeli center views, or at least center left views? Do you think he's really an outlier within Haaretz, or are there others like him that you've come across that, you know, they might not be fair all the time, but they certainly aren't extremists and they aren't extremely biased. I, I think actually there's a quite uh, a variety of views at Haaretz. If you're talking about the opinion pages, he's more of a uh, columnist, but if you want to look at people who are dealing more with analysis, analysis out bad, they, they do run quite um, a variety of writers. Um, some who uh, are, are off the charts in the kinds of falsehoods that they that they write and, and some who are very solid. So. I don't see him as particularly, I mean, you know, he's kind of a, a mixed bag and I don't see him as particularly out of place there in any way. Okay. All right, let's transition to another topic. Uh, someone has a question about Peter Beinart. Uh, the question is, Peter Beinart has uh, also associated with a formerly moribund but now uh, resurrected far-left magazine called Jewish Currents. The magazine is quickly attracting attention from leftists who dominate uh, some, some within the mainstream media. Um, it will become a very troubling but influential presence in the world of opinion and thought. It deserves careful watching. Ironically, in the late 60s and early 70s, it was led by old Stalinists, but surprisingly supportive of Israel. Uh, of course, not now. 
So I guess the question about Peter Beinart and his new incarnation as an anti-Zionist, uh, no longer working for mainstream publications. And in fact, he used to work, he used to be a columnist for Haaretz. Now he's with, he's with Jew, Jew, Jewish currents. Do you think he's going to be less influential in this niche publication? Or do you think he'll, he will still have an impact within the media outlets that you cover? Well, Peter Barnard also just got a position at the, at the New York Times as a contributing opinion. Oh, right, right. So um, he's, he's, you know, from, from Jewish Currents, he's been elevated to the, the most lofty media, you know, prestigious, uh, one, uh, one, considered prestigious media outlet in the United States. So um, I don't think that his writing at the Jewish Currents is going to um, sort of sideline him in, in any way. Um, certainly his, his recent essay about why he is not a Zionist um, got him a tremendous publicity and attention. So um, uh, I think that it, it, it will be, you know, whether he publishes there or in the New York Times, he is a voice that um, continues to have uh, uh, make waves in the mainstream media, at least in the United States. Okay. It's not much in Israel, by the way. He's, he doesn't, he hasn't garnered much interest here in Israel. Interesting. Interesting. Um, here's another question. Uh, often talked about is the troubling trend of the blurring of news with opinion. A uh, problem that's in part attributed to the fact that some journalists see their job uh, almost like as an expression of their political activism. In your view, is this dynamic equally as pronounced in all the international media arenas you, you operate in? Or are some countries less prone to such advocacy journalism? Well, at one time, I would have said that in the British press, the news columns, news stories are all mixed together with partisan uh, opinions. And then the, the American media was distinct and had more of a, a, a solid wall between the news and op-ed sections. I'm not sure I can say that with confidence any longer. I feel like the, the wall separating uh, editorializing, keeping editorializing out of the news stories and the American media has been eroded over the last number of years. Um, if we looked be beyond the UK and England, I know from speaking with my colleagues at Afroiki Tabla and at uh, Revista de Medio Orient, the French and Spanish language press, um, political advocacy and journalism is also uh, in those countries and languages in France and Brussels, is very, is very prevalent and very common. Um, Laurent Chaim from Fouki Tabla says from uh, people who have been observing the issues going back to the 2000 after the Aldora affair when a French media outlet falsely charged Israel of, of shooting uh, a Palestinian child as he crouched behind his father in the beginning of the second intifada. And that sparked major uh, rioting against Israel, demonstrations against Israel across the Arab world and, and terror attacks and so on and so forth. So then the Arab press, sorry, the French press was even um, even more politicized and radical um, in its news coverage of Israel. It seems to have been somewhat, um, even though the level is, is, is not what we would aspire to, it, it's better than it was following the second intifada. And I would say out of all the areas that we cover, certainly the countries in this region, I'm talking about Egypt, Saudi Arabia, um, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, to, to also to a great degree, all, many Arab countries or, or all of them, um, are, are, uh, there is no free press. So the, there, is, there is no separation. There is no, there is no notion or, or value of separation between uh, opinion and, uh, and news, and that the government have, the governments in various countries have co-opted the press to make them government mouthpieces. And this is true also for the Palestinian Authority. We have a terrific piece by um, uh, Yoni Ben Menachem, who's formerly the head of the Israel Broadcast Authority and was a correspondent of Arab affairs for many, many years, who writes about this phenomenon. And he talks about the issue in the Palestinian territories where he says that the Palestinian Authority has fully embraced the notion of journalism in the service of the revolution, uh, where governments simply can just shut down stories that they don't want out there. I mean, look, Saudi Arabia killed, brutally murdered a journalist uh, who was critical of the regime. 
Um, and, and, and moreover, we, I mentioned in my talk that there were some uh, publications like uh, Sky News Arabia, which is half owned by Comcast and half owned by an Emirati company. And um, Independent Arabia, which was founded in 2019, is Saudi owned, even though it carries the name of uh, a British publication and it's based in London. So those papers are, of course, in a different category than Arab, fully Arab run newspapers in, in the Arab world. Um, nevertheless, as uh, many articles posted on, on your website, Camera UK, posted in English, and also we have them in Arabic at Camera Arabic, have shown that even at these publications, you can see how the Emirati or the Saudi government has affected the, the coverage, how the interests of those governments are reflected in the coverage. So um, I noted that the Sky News Arabia, which is a half Emirati owned, recently corrected for the very first time after they published a report which overstated uh, the surprisingly high figure for Arab support for normalization. So it was good news already, but they made it even into better news. Um, and the fact that they corrected for the very first time after we turned to them from many times and many occasions from many different errors and they never corrected, I said, maybe this is the fruit of normalization. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say that they're all of a sudden embracing the democratic norm of a free press, which champions the truth, just maybe now their interests are more aligned with, with pro-Israel interests. Um, so, so maybe that's why there's more of a willingness to accurately report on, on Israel um, and to be responsive to, to our requests. Um, and, and also there's a difference, you know, if we start from the, the media outlets in the Arab world, we go to the, the half-owned, half-Western-owned, half-Arab-owned media outlets like Sky News in Arabia, Sky News and, and uh, The Independent. Then from there, you have the other media outlets, which are fully Western, like ABC, Reuters, and they have um, more oversight and, and more adherence to the Western notions of, of uh, journalistic norms. And this is precisely why we have focused on, on this group of media outlets. You know, when we started Camera Arabic, we didn't, we, we didn't even try to look at Arab owned and run media outlets because they have completely different notions of what journalism should be and we had no hope of impacting them. Even Al Jazeera is kind of on the, on the border there. It considers itself and tries to uh, have the appearance of a Western media outlet, um, but, but it really, the Qatari-owned uh, media outlet really does not embrace those values. Although we did have a nice success with them, very surprising uh, success with them once in the past, but we, we generally don't concentrate on Al Jazeera for, the, for that reason. Right. Now, just following up for a second, your uh, career with camera goes back over 20 years. Uh, have you seen, you know, year after year, the change in professional journalistic standards such that you can remember a time when there was that wall between news and opinion and journalists were much more careful to uh, express their personal opinions? Yeah, I, I spoke in my talk about the globalization of the media in the last 20 years. I'd say the other huge phenomenon which greatly impacted media was the digitalization of the media. Uh, going online. You know, when I started, the New York Times was was a newspaper that you picked up in the morning and threw out by the end of the day. Um, and it had a website, but not many people went to it. Now it has all the whistles and bells that any self-respecting, you know, media outlet of, of 2020 has. Um, it's invested enormously into podcasts. It has blogs, um, micro blogs in the form of every journalist has their own feed, their own Twitter, uh, feed um, and they've invested huge, huge money and uh, resources into forensic journalism. For instance, they did this tr huge story, uh, spent a lot of money and many, many hours and over 4,000 words looking into the story of a, a Gaza medic, a woman who was killed on the border in, in one of these March of Return violent um, demonstrations where there have been um, it's, it, you know, they're described as demonstrations or protests, but they also involve gunfire and, and Molotov cocktails and, and destruction of the fence. In any event, so the New York Times, you know, went all, all tech on that. And, and, um, and look, you don't have to go that far back. We can just look to the news of last week 
with the podcast Caliphate, which was an acclaimed podcast that the New York Times ran supposedly of a Canadian, Pakistani Canadian who um, had joined ISIS and he engaged, in, he rose in the ranks of ISIS and it included you know, graphic bloody accounts of executions that he said he carried out. And even though some of the older, more experienced, more um, old school journalism journalists at the New York Times raised red flags throughout the production of this acclaimed podcast, which won all kinds of awards, raised red flags about the credibility, about the fact checking. Do we have any way to, to, um, to, to verify that? Any outside independence and, and things that weren't matching up and they raised red flags and they were pushed aside and this went forward and look what happened. The New York Times just returned to prestigious journalism awards that it had received for this series. Um, so that that is a really, I think it's a low point that it, at the time, I, I don't remember which senior editor said, but uh, when they were boasting about the broadcast and they really put a lot into promoting it, they said, this is the new face of the New York Times. Um, and indeed it is, you know, in, in the last few years, fact checkers, not, not only have journalism, as I mentioned, budgets have been cut, and that's cut the staff or correspondents, for instance, stationed here, and that's why they've had to rely more on the wire services. But beyond the actual reporters, uh, at the New York Times, for instance, fact checkers have been cut. And this led to even a demonstration on the part of journalists at the New York Times out, you know, saying, this is going to impact the quality of our work. And indeed it has. The New York Times response at the time was, well, we, we have the, the Twitter sphere, you know, people are always tweeting to us uh, with all due respect, you know, Twitter and, and, and the public does, you know, we at Camera of all places and, and organizations know this, there's a place for, um, for well-researched criticism on that which comes in from the public, but to the, for the media outlets to throw up their hands and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll just, we have people on Twitter telling us if we have a problem and that's our editing. That's, that's simply, that that harms the, the quality of coverage. When you cut the ombuds people and you cut the, the proofreaders. Um, so right. all of this has, has hurt the, the quality of the coverage. Okay, well, one last quick question before we begin to wrap up. Uh, do you go after right-wing "Quote unquote" pro-Israel publications in the U.S. and/or Israel, um, such as Fox News, the Washington Examiner, the Wall Street Journal, Israel Hayom, just as aggressively as you go after "quote unquote" left-wing media outlets. Absolutely. I mean, in my presentation, I mentioned, for instance, the Washington Examiner, which was the only media outlet of the number that I approached on that particular issue who didn't correct, um, especially here in Israel, where uh, if you're going to let me re let me expand your question and say not only do we address this or that criticism based on whether it's coming from this media outlet or that media outlet it doesn't where where it's appearing it doesn't matter the source of the misinformation that doesn't interest us it doesn't right. even interest us if the misinformation is in israel's you know to israel's detriment or in israel's favor we even respond to misinformation that we find that is in Israel's favor. And that happens much less often. But for instance, the story that I mentioned about um, the Sky News Arabia and then all these Israeli and, and, and Jewish and conservative publications inflating the good news about Arab uh, support for normalization, that's, that's news, that was an error going in Israel's favor. Uh, so we don't hesitate uh, because we believe that our, our our, our, our power, our strength is um, upholding the facts. And, and, and this is, is what makes us so uh, successful, which, whichever the way the facts fall, and overwhelmingly they do fall in one direction, which is against Israel. But anyone can feel free to go to our websites and see the criticisms that we have posted um, on Fox News. Uh, Hebrew readers can go and see that we recently criticized a column by right-wing columnist Carolyn Blake at Israel Hayom, who said, oh, look, the Gulf states um, are honoring the uh, IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance of, uh, Alliance definition for anti-Semitism, uh, which includes that if you oppose Zionism, you oppose the notion of a Jewish state for the Jewish people, uh, that's anti-Semitism. And she said, but the Europeans don't accept this. And we pointed out, well, actually, 
European countries, almost across the board, universally accept the IHRA definition. It is broadly embraced in Europe. So uh, we have no hesitation to, uh, to call out a media outlet, whatever their political leanings are, and even whatever the nature of the error is, so we will not hesitate. Okay, thanks, Tamari. We have other questions, but that's all we have time for. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Tamara, for demonstrating, I think, very clearly and very precisely the impact of Cameras Israel office um, on the international media. And I guess what I would describe as the synergy between uh, various camera departments. Uh, please visit our website at camera.org. Follow us on Twitter at camera.org or like us on Facebook. Um, before we conclude the program, I just want to quickly send a shout out to uh, Paul and Leno Sislin, uh, who uh, generous supporters of Camera, who actually support um, the Israel Camera's Israel office. And in fact, the Camera's Israel office where I work is named after the Sislin. So uh, your support is greatly appreciated. Uh, that concludes today's program. Stay tuned, of course, for more Camera webinars. And that concludes today's program. Thanks again, everyone.